Piva il tabeva, everyone. Mina uh, olen rege, and that's about as far as I get in my Finnish. Um, I am very happy to be here today to talk to you about comics as a youth and young adult literature. Um, I'll be speaking for about an hour and then uh, there's a lot of time for questions afterwards. So if uh, you have something that pops up during uh, the lecture that you want to ask me about, please feel free to save them for later. And then um, uh, I look forward to hearing uh, your questions and comments. So um, here's a little overview of what I'm going to talk to you about uh, today. Um, I've put it into three uh, parts where the first part is a little bit of a history uh, because this uh, question of children and comics or young people and comics, um, it's been going back and forth. Uh, are comics for children? Maybe they're no longer for children. Now, all of a sudden, maybe they're for children again. So uh, I'll uh, try to uh, frame the some of the historical discussions uh, on the topic. And then I have a section where I uh, dive deeper into how do we analyze um, youth and young adult comics as literature. And a lot of that is going to be um, comics analysis uh, that is specific to the medium, but some of it is also going to be highlighting some of the uh, theoretical uh, discussion and some of the uh, different uh, studies and some of the research that's gone into um, uh, this uh, children and comics field. And then the last part, I'll uh, zoom in on um, youth and young adult literature comics in teaching. Um, what are some of the things that we uh, can, if we're teaching, we can um, use the comics for and uh, how can we go about that? And um, I'll just give you a little slide uh, of presentation, a little bit about who I am. Uh, and that uh, also addresses this aspect of teaching and comics because um, I have a PhD in comparative literature, but I wrote my PhD on comics. So I've been studying comics for a long time now. Um, I've been teaching and researching comics. And then I spent five years in Texas where I taught Danish uh, as a subject. But then, of course, my students also read a lot of comics and uh, also Danish comics. Um, and I've written a book to uh, teach students about how to use comics in teaching. Right now, I'm teaching at the um, Teacher College Copenhagen. So I'm teaching teacher students. Uh, and one of the things I teach them is about um, comics as uh, children's literature and how to analyze them. So uh, enough about that. Let's uh, get into uh, the lecture. I've put this quote uh, from Christopher Pisino uh, from his book, Arresting Development Comics at the Boundaries of Literature. Uh, here at the front, because uh, this is uh, one of the things that is going to be popping up during uh, this lecture and uh, something that is um, something that's important to understand when we uh, study comics uh, as literature and uh, especially when it comes to children uh, and uh, comics as literature. Because on the one hand, he says comics have often been dismissed as child fair. That's where when you tell someone, uh, I like to read comics or I study comics, and maybe they'll tell you, oh, but I, I mean, comics, that's for children, right? So there is this idea that uh, comics is not serious, it's funny, and it's also maybe for uh, uh, children and thus not serious. And we can, we can think about how this connection between something that's for children and then it's not serious, but as soon as it, it's for adult, then we can take it serious, how that might not be the case. Um, but there is, and historically, there have been a, a tendency to think of comics as something for children. Then on the other hand, when you study comics, um, today there, there are uh, some uh, especially something like the graphic novel, uh, and I'll get more into detail about that, but uh, ideas about how comics, uh, they've become more literary, they've be they've ha have, have gotten a different kind of audience, so now comics are also for adult, and then uh, perhaps they're no longer for children. So at the same time, comics are something uh, 
that are for children and then they're also not for children. And I'll go back and forth uh, between the two positions and talk a little bit about why that is, but also how that uh, might influence uh, us uh, when we're studying comics. So that's uh, at the, uh, the bottom of all that I'm going to say here. So um, as I said, I'll start with a little bit of history uh, about comics and young people in particular, because um, on the one hand, comics, uh, it's a, an older medium. It's something that's been around and we can discuss origins. That's a whole nother discussion. But uh, what is the first comic and, and when did this medium uh, originate? Somewhere around the 1800s, middle 1800s, late 1800s, um, in the form that we think about comics today. But uh, during that history, uh, the the medium and its relationship with children has uh, uh, changed and it's undergone some certain uh, historical circumstances that also influence uh, how we uh, look at comics um, today. So the first question, are comics for children? Question mark. Uh, if we look at something uh, like the yellow kid that we see here, RF Oko's uh, comic, Many scholars will point to that as one of the first comics. Um, if we define comics as uh, sequential images uh, with or without uh, text that are published uh, or they're widely uh, distributed in some kind of way, then The Yellow Kid uh, fits that description. And The Yellow Kid is, is a comic that was published in newspapers uh, and it's about uh, a little boy. He has this uh, yellow shirt and uh, in the beginning when he he was speaking the speech balloons are actually what is written on his shirt so uh, from the very beginning we see children in comics uh, and uh, as main characters and of course that ties in with a discussion we have in the field of children's literature how do we define children's literature so if children children's literature we can define it as uh, the literature that children reads, then it's very broad, or uh, it can also be literature about children, or it can be literature made by children. So if we look at something like The Yellow Kid, here is a comic about uh, a child and some of the uh, mischievous things that he gets up to in his day, and it was very popular and people were reading it in the, in the newspapers. So one of the things that happens is that uh, these newspaper strips that are very popular, they get put together uh, in little pamphlets or in little books, and then they start, uh, uh, first they get published in the newspapers, and then uh, when they get put together in a book, then you can sell them again, so to speak. So these little um, uh, comic books start becoming very popular, and a lot of them are humor comics, so that's also where we get the, in English at least, the connection with the comical, the funny, uh, we have the word comics, but also back then, uh, many of these books were called funnies. So um, if we look at children as audiences, were the children reading the comics? If we get to uh, the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s in America, where a lot of the research on children and, and comics as audiences are done, um, this uh, quote from Carol Tilly, who's a historian who's been studying uh, comics and children uh, and uh, the way that children engage with comics a lot, she has uh, pointed out that a study that was done in 1943 um, found that about 95% of elementary age children read comic books often and only about 90% uh, of high school age students did. But that's also a lot of the children reading comics at this point in time in history. So um, when we're looking at the 1930s to 50s in America, uh, almost all children were reading comics. And what she also points out is that it was, uh, to a very large degree, a participatory practice. So the children were engaging with the comics. They were making their own comics. They were writing letters. They were making fan scenes. So they were um, they were engaged in a fandom and being creative themselves uh, with these publications. And very often also, when we look at readership at this point of time, how many children were reading comics, because the the comic strips were serialized, then um, 
uh, there are different uh, uh, main characters and maybe you couldn't afford all of the series but then if you bought one of the series and then every Wednesday you got the new book but one of your friends bought the other series then you could uh, swap them with each other and you could read a lot more different uh, comic series so in that sense we know that um, the distribution of the individual comic was also probably a lot larger than than the sales numbers because the children were engaging in these uh, communities where they were sharing their comics, they were uh, swapping them, they were selling them to each other. And then uh, uh, because they were very cheap materials, so so um, they were also accessible for children. And of course, in Scandinavia and the Nordic countries, uh, someone like uh, I took the, the, the cover of the first uh, Donald Duck magazine in Denmark, Anna Sand, but um, um, of course, in Finland, it's also a very uh, popular title. So the Disney comics, especially Donald Duck, uh, becomes a, a major publication in, in children's uh, media um, from 19, uh, late 1940s and onwards. Um, and of course, also later on uh, uh, in France, there's uh, something like uh, Tintin, which is uh, also starts in a magazine and then later on becomes this publication that you buy uh, comic books or you buy the albums and then you read the comics. So um, if we look at it historically, there's uh, a lot of um, uh, comics being read by children. So at this point, it's a children's literature, at least if we look at uh, the audiences. And then uh, something happens in the 1950s uh, with this um, psychiatrist, Frederick Wortham from the US, who writes a book called The Seduction of the Innocent. And uh, it's a book that um, at around this time, uh, there are certain criticisms arising towards comics. Um, parents, librarians, uh, teachers, um, and the general public are beginning to worry about uh, the comics that the children are reading and how they're influencing the children. What is the effect of this material? And a lot of that has to do with it being visual material so the, that you can, you can look at uh, pictures and you can see things. And um, some of the comics and some of the genres, they're violent or maybe there's uh, sex in them. Um, so there's something about the topics that are... Uh, being put out in comic book form that uh, people start to worry about what the children are reading. And Fredling Wortham's book is, um, uh, it's an interesting uh, piece of scholarship. And it's also, it's interesting if uh, uh, looking into some of the reception, there's a lot of books written now about Frederick Wortham's book because of uh, how influential it became. But one of the things that he does is that he, he interviews children and he st uh, studies the children and their reading habits. And he um, argues that uh, there are different, uh, that there are various uh, causalities between reading comics and the effects of children. So um, he says that uh, uh, you can become um, a juvenile delinquent from reading comics, or uh, maybe your your. He also he has uh, hypotheses, or he claims that your uh, your ability to read is is worsened because there are pictures. Uh, there's also some of the ideological content where, for instance, he points to Wonder Woman and she's a very strong woman and uh, she's a superhero and she she does not comply with the traditional gender roles. And uh, that is um, that can be dangerous to the children. So there's a lot of discussion uh, in the 1950s about the effect of comics uh, on children. And there's, of course, the discussion in America where it's very much a bit about different types, specific types of comics, especially horror comics and uh, crime comics and how they might influence the children in a bad way. But in Europe, the discussion very early on becomes about uh, anti-Americanism. So uh, in 1949, there's a law in France that actually protects the, the, the homemade uh, comic, the comics uh, that are made in, in France uh, from the American comics. 
uh, because during the, during the war, it, they weren't able to import comics from America. So after the war, the Second World War, they're trying to keep the American comics uh, from from uh, being published. And there's there's a law that is uh, actually implemented there to protect the youth from the effects of American comics. In Scandinavia and in the European con context, a lot of the discussions are similar. So uh, many books are published uh, all over the world that more or less takes quotes from Fred Wortham's books and publish them. Uh, so I took the Danish example, Turk Hakstausen, um, Education for Terror, uh, which is, uh, and this wonderful cover where we see a, a child that's standing uh, with, uh, we can't really tell if it's a toy gun or a gun, but he's standing on comics. So we get the sense that the comics are uh, uh, influencing him in a certain way. So this actually leads to, uh, in some cases, at least, uh, burning of comics. And I, uh, historically, that's very interesting because, of course, even in Germany, they're, they're burning uh, comics, considering uh, what uh, associations we might have with book burnings during the Second World War. So there's, uh, at least uh, among some people, there's a consensus that this material is so bad that it's actually okay to to uh, collect it together and, and burn them. Um, so I brought an example here from Helle Stranko Jensen, who has written about the Scandinavian debate. Uh, and uh, from this quote, we can see that it's about uh, raising children in the names of violence, race, hatred, gangsters, and pinups. So this is also this uh, uh, argument that is very much about anti-Americanism, that it's, it's something that's coming from uh, the US and it's actually influencing the Scandinavian children and the societies in Scandinavia in a bad way. So um, uh, this quote from a, an open letter to the Swedish government that's actually written by uh, the uh, Malmö Peace Con Committee and uh, the Swedish Women's Left Union. So what's interesting about this historically is also that it's politically, it's the left and the right that can actually agree on something. And that's that comics are bad and it's bad for children. Um, so uh, you want to raise children that are good and harmonic and optimistic with respect for their fellow humans. And the idea is that comics will actually influence in them in the opposite way. And um, some of the uh, research that's done on uh, children and uh, comics, at least here in the uh, historical context, in, in Finland is uh, Ralf Kauran, and uh, he wrote a PhD thesis about um, uh, this comics debate in Finland in the 1950s. Um, and one of the things that he also finds is that uh, it's seen comics they're seen as a foreign cultural element and it's a threat to the children's up upbringing. And if we follow that through, then it actually also becomes a danger to the future of Finnish society. So of course, um, if, if that is the belief, that's a very serious thing. So that's why uh, um, from the 50s, there is also this sense that uh, children are, uh, comics are for children, but also that maybe they're dangerous for children and children shouldn't be reading comics because it might influence their ability to read. And also it will influence them badly in uh, with uh, ideology that we don't want them uh, to be influenced by. So we can say that's something that happened in the 50s, but it's a discussion that is still going on. And of course, censorship discussions are some uh, discussions that are currently happening all over the, uh, the world. Um, and in 2010 in Denmark, we had um, what uh, some might call the child pornography man manga debate because a member of uh, parliament suggested that um, uh, manga, Japanese comics uh, uh, that were uh, about um, children and child pornography should be um, forbidden and we should make a law uh, uh, that um, made sure that that happened. So there was a, a big debate about whether or not drawn child pornography can be um, uh, can be considered the same as actual uh, pornography with uh, with film of real children uh, so so that was a debate in the end it ended up not being a law and it it uh, it wasn't something that was implemented but it just uh, goes to say that this concern for the impact 
of uh, visual materials like uh, comics and and the way that comics can influence children it's it's still very much uh, something uh, that we can encounter in this field especially in um, uh, america at the moment there's a lot of focus on uh, book banning and uh, it's uh, banning schools from li uh, um, books from libraries or schools and uh, quite a few of them actually are comics and comics uh, young adult comics uh, one example is Gillian Tamaki's This One Summer, which was banned for uh, uh, for its LGBT uh, characters, uh, drug use and profanity. So here there's also um, the, um, the concern that there is content within these uh, young adult comics that can influence children uh, in, a, in a bad way. Another example is uh, uh, Raina Telgemeier's drama. And uh, the the reason for banning that is because it includes LGBT characters. Uh, it's also deemed sexually explicit and was considered to have an offensive political viewpoint. So here it's also about uh, different uh, types of political ideologies that um, uh, parents or uh, uh, teachers or members of the school board uh, considered uh, something that they did not want their children to be influenced by. Um, Raina Telgemeier is not only uh, one of the most popular uh, comics artists for uh, uh, young adult comics or for children's comics, she's one of the most popular artists for comics, period. If we look at the um, the sales numbers of American comics, Raina Telgemeier is often at the very top. So um, the young adult comic scene in, in the US is really uh, booming and she's a very, very popular uh, artist. Her response was that finding your identity, whether gay or straight, is a huge part of middle school. So um, if we know something about young adult literature, we also know that it that is probably the biggest theme of young adult literature, finding out who you are, uh, finding your place in the world and the development that uh, a young person goes through. Uh, so many of the stories, that's a very uh, a key issue. So uh, her response is that then some uh, young people, uh, for them, that uh, is also part of the developing their identity and finding out uh, who they are and, and how they fit in the world. Um, I, uh, I put a slide here uh, from the comic book Legal Defense Fund just to uh, show that this discussion of censorship and uh, um, which is very often also uh, connected to freedom of speech. Um, uh, the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund in the US is, is an organization that um, raises money to fight some of the legal battles when artists or uh, comic book owners get into uh, suits in America where they're, they're sued uh, for publishing or for distributing material that, that, are, uh, that might be deemed offensive. So it's just to say that in the 1950s, uh, comics uh, had this uh, event where uh, there was a very big international discussion about whether or not comics were dangerous and not good reading materials and should not be uh, considered children's or young adult literature. Um, and that discussion is still going on. Um, so very briefly, um, in the 1970s and 1980s um, in Scandinavia, there was also, so in, in the Nordic countries, uh, we, uh, we are in, a, in, in an interesting position because um, a lot of the American and English language material in comics were translated into the languages uh, in the Nordic countries, but then also the European uh, comics tradition, and then uh, later on also a lot of the Asian comic uh, traditions were translated into to the local languages, and especially in the 1970s and 80s, um, the album boom, uh, a lot of the French language uh, and uh, Central European comics were translated into, here we have Swedish, uh, Finnish, and Danish. Um, so uh, uh, in this period, uh, reading comics was also a big thing uh, among adults, but also among uh, children and young people uh, in the region. 
uh, and as a final thing that I think is important to mention when we talk about the history of comics, manga, of course, in the 2000s uh, had a very big uh, uh, popularity peak where uh, a lot of uh, uh, Japanese uh, manga and um, uh, different types of Asian comics were translated and very much found uh, a, a young readership. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, children and young people were reading uh, a lot of manga. And it sort of uh, faded away for a while. And um, if we look around now, it seems like it's coming back and manga has become popular and more titles get translated again. Of course, um, many of the, the youths in, um, in the Nordic countries read the manga in English, uh, but some of them are also translated into the local languages. And um, because a manga is also, like I talked about earlier with the, um, with, uh, uh, participatory practice and uh, the way that uh, children and young people engage with comics as a culture and as a part of uh, being part of a community. Uh, manga is very much also something that uh, um, engages children. There's a lot of festivals and uh, cosplay where you dress like the characters from the manga. Um, so, um, and a lot of fan fiction and a lot of uh, fan culture surrounding manga. So, so that's also uh, uh, a big part of children's culture when we look at uh, children and comics or um, young people and comics. Um, but uh, I'll I'll move on because um, uh, we we need to uh, also get to where we look into the comics. Um, what happens uh, also alongside this uh, historical development is at a certain point, the discussion starts coming up that maybe comics are no longer for children. There is, of course, first the, the one in the 50s where maybe they're dangerous, but also that comics might be for adults as well as something new. And that very much has to do with the comic, uh, with the concept, the graphic novel, which um, some scholars attribute to the artist Will Eisner when he made his comic um, um, A Contract with God and other tenement stories, which is about a Jewish community in New York. Uh, the point is that Will Eisner was interested in uh, the comic form, images and text and telling stories in that way. But because there was this idea that comics were for children or that it was not a serious medium, it was difficult for him, him to to get uh, people to read his more uh, adult serious stories. So uh, the graphic novel is also a way of uh, relabeling a medium so that it's not comics, so it's not about being funny, but uh, the graphic novel has this uh, aura of being more serious. And when I talk to artist, comics artists, some will say, well, the graphic novel is just another word for a very expensive hardcover comic. And um, the question is, well, maybe that might be true, uh, but maybe there's also something special about what we call the graphic novel. Some of the more uh, famous graphic novels that uh, can also be taught in schools and can also be read uh, by um, some of the older uh, young audience uh, are uh, titles like uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse or um, Alison Bechdel's Fun Home. Art Spiegelman's Mouse, is a graphic novel about uh, his parents and their uh, experiences in the concentration camp Auschwitz. And um, what is um, really confusing, but also very um, interesting about this is that the, the Jews are drawn as mice and the, uh, the Nazis are drawn as cats. And in that way, Art Spiegelman draws on a, a long history of uh, within comics and within the medium of uh, uh, animals as characters. Uh, think about when we were talking about um, Donald Duck. And uh, so this is a, a very important graphic novel that comes out uh, in, in the mid 1980s and also really uh, begins to set the scene for this idea that comics can be an adult uh, literary medium. Um, we can see here at the front page that uh, it's a winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and I think it's important to say that's 
uh, very new and uh, extraordinary at this point that a comic can win the Pulitzer Prize because um, that's a, a very high uh, esteemed, highly esteemed um, prize. But it's actually a special Pulitzer Prize because at this point they were still a little um, cautious about this. Can we really, can comics really uh, talk about serious uh, things like this? Fun Home is Alison Bechdel's uh, personal story about uh, growing out and finding her own uh, sexual identity and realizing that her, her father was a, a closeted gay man and how that connects them and then um, how she how that repositions her view on um, when he later uh, commits suicide, how that also uh, gives her a new interpretation. And um, so this is... As I'm sure you can tell, uh, comics that are about very serious and very adult uh, topics, and some of them might not be for children, certainly not for younger children, uh, but also uh, they have a very adult co uh, content. And that's one of the things that um, researchers like, for instance, Jen Bartons and Hugo Frey are pointing towards when they're saying that there is something uh, there's a concept that we can use called the graphic novel that sets it apart from all the Donald Duck and all the superhero comics. And um, one of the things they point to is layout and composition, that um, the way that the comics are designed and their layout and the way that they tell stories is more complicated than we have seen um, before this and that we see in some of the other um, comics, types of comics. Um, the thing about the content that it's adult, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, about violence or sex or drugs or something like that, but also just that it's uh, it's topics that do not interest children. So there are a lot of uh, personal narratives. There's a lot of autobiographies in, in the graphic novel. novel. And um, some of them are about... Uh, men in the, their 50s and their midlife crisis. And that's just not something that an 11 year old wants to read about. So uh, in that sense, the content is adult uh, also because it's something that adults are interested in. Uh, and then the publication format, this uh, that it's very often uh, a collected story like a book in a hardcover and it's uh, also this thing about production and distribution now it's sold in bookstores and if you go into a, a, a good bookstore today you can find a graphic novel section which is very different from going to the comic book store or to uh, the newspaper agent and uh, picking up your comic book so there's something about uh, the graphic novel that um gives a, a form of comics a way of being taken seriously and uh, now it can be reviewed in the cultural section of the newspapers and it becomes something that is um, uh, very um, uh, con considered adult literature as well. Um, and one of the things that we can see here in the Nordic countries is that just recently uh, the, the prize, uh, the Nordic Prize for Literature, actually uh, for the first time uh, was awarded to a graphic novel when uh, with the Joanna Rubin Granger's uh, comic. Uh, so, um, or graphic novel. I mean, that's one of the things that we can discuss uh, about this concept. But when we look at children's uh, comics and uh, our children, our comics for children, then the graphic novel actually uh, is also a period where um, the media and uh, the, the the publishers are so concerned with the fact that comics can also, now they can be for adults. There are so many headlines in this period. Spiff, bam, crikey. Comics are no longer for children. It's a very new and surprising thing. But that also means that um, the children readers uh, are perhaps not uh, taken into account. But that's something that recently I think has uh, changed and we're seeing uh, so many more um, uh, publications for children and young adults in the comics format. So um, uh, there was a there was a period where uh, comics the the focus were not on children's comics, but I think that's coming back. And um, if we read in English, uh, there's a, as I said a very big market, but there's also more and more translation and actually also uh, uh, comics that are made um, within the Nordic region at least. So 
uh, I think that that that's one of the things that when you're interested in children and comics, it's also important that there are materials that you that the the children and the young people can read and and that they have uh, a high quality so that um, that uh, they're good uh, literature. But um, I'll talk about um, analyzing comics a bit. That um, uh, when we this was the historical view. So what are some of the circumstances con con concerning uh, comics? And um, uh, then when we study literature, uh, we are very used to looking at uh, language, at written language, and we have different ways of approaching the written language. Uh, uh, but one of the things that can be difficult when reading comics is, of course, that there's also a visual di dimension and we have to take that into account as well. So um, I will begin with just touching a little bit about the form an analysis of comics. And that's where um, we look at what are some of the formal elements that are important when we want to work with comics as literature, as something that we can analyze. So I just put a few of the, the titles here. Um, I started working in comic scholarship uh, in 2005, I think. And at that point, there were very few journals. There were very few conferences. There were not a lot of materials out there for people studying comics. But since then, it's actually an academic field that has really expanded. And there are so many interesting uh, research studies uh, out there now in many different types of uh, topics. And also, these are just a few of the titles here. Uh, that are concerned with looking at how are the, uh, what are the mechanics of comics, how are they put together, and how do comics make meaning. Um, and uh, Scott McLeod's Understanding Comics is uh, one of the first really serious uh, long uh, length studies where he tries, to, he's also a comics artist, and his, his, his attempt is to try to talk about what is it that, um, how is it that comics work? But with what is, of course, also really important and impressive with this book is that he draws it in a comic book format. But that's also um, a reason why it's uh, very accessible and it's, uh, uh, it's theoretical discussions about the mechanics of comics that are actually uh, uh, easier to read and easier to understand because he also draws his example as he's explaining them. So there's a lot of work being done uh, within this, uh, the formal part. Um, one of the things that we, as I was saying, we have to take into consideration is that the that image and text are juxtaposed and they work together in the comics format. And there are also a lot of theories about um, uh, how that relationship works. Um, so when we're studying comics, it's important to look at both uh, the image and the text, but also how they work together. And that's where someone like, for instance, WJT Mitchell has a concept of image text, where the two are actually not taken apart, but they work together so that when we look at something like comics, it's not image and text, it's image text that um, the uh, the meaning of the comic is produced by both the image and the text. And when they work together, it makes something more than what the meaning is when the different modalities are just on their own. So um, there are different approaches I picked. Uh, uh, Marianne Eskebeck, who wrote a book in Danish about picture literature, where she she says that you can look at uh, three different types of interaction. She talks about parallel voices. That's where the image and the text are uh, making the same meaning, more or less. Um, that's something that we see in a lot of children's books for very small children. Uh, there's a picture of an apple and then it says, here is an apple. Um, then there are the intertwined voices where um, the image and the text are uh, working together. They're not saying the same thing, but they're creating a meaning together or they're complementing each other in different ways. And then there are the contradictory voices where what is happening on the image side uh, and what is being uh, talked about on the verbal side um, are actually uh, 
opposing or they're working against each other in different ways and that creates creates an interesting effect as well. So that's one way of saying looking at the the collaboration or uh, the contesting between image and text and how that makes meaning when we look at comics. Um, Nikolaeva and Scott has uh, five different ways of interacting. And if we look at someone like Scott McLeod, he has seven different ways of looking at what are the inter ways that text and image can work together or how they relate to each other when they're on the page together in comics. Um, so um, uh, it's important that when we study comics that we really look closely at uh, the meaning that is being created uh, from text and image. Another thing that Scott McLeod is very famous for having coined is the term closure, where um, in the book Understanding Comics, he argues that um, one of the most important thing about the comics medium is that it's fragmented, that it's made out of all these little bits and pieces of text and image and the way that they're put together on the page and the way that um, the reader has to move from one uh, panel or one um, uh, square uh, to another uh, and they have to add meaning and they have to make sense of the fragments that that's an important part of the comics medium. So it's also an important part that we can look at when we have to analyze um, comics. So um, uh, he described it, describes it as the phenomenon of uh, observing the parts, but perceiving the whole. So uh, uh, if we look at examples, for instance, it's always uh, easier to have these theoretical concepts uh, into concrete examples. Um, something like composition is incredibly important when we look at the comics book page because um, the way that uh, the different panels are uh, placed, their size and the individual panels and how they make meaning, how they're next to each other um, is very important for how we uh, uh, analyze uh, the comic. Here's a page from uh, Mayan Satrapi's Persepolis, which is uh, a comic that is also uh, very widely taught in, in Danish schools uh, and uh, I think uh, many places internationally about, uh, which is also an autobiographical account of her um, childhood in Iran and uh, how it is uh, growing up in Iran and what happens to her. But what if we look at uh, the structure of the comic book page, um, what I'm trying to show here is that the classic grid in comics is this three by three, the nine panel grid. But then there are a lot of ways in which the artist can break that classical grid. Maybe you can make a panel that is just like we see here uh, on the left, three panels, or you can make the whole page a panel, or you don't even have to stay within the grid. You can make very uh, different uh, lines and shapes of the panels. So it's important that when we're reading comics and we're analyzing comics to not just look at the individual panel as we follow the story, but also look at how the, the complete composition looks. So one thing, as I was saying, we can read the panel by panel uh, like this, but then we can also look at the whole page. Is there something that is uh, connecting the top and the bottom? Are there similarities, other ways in which they are the same? Or we can look at, say we have an element in one panel and another panel, uh, and this can be across pages. So uh, the, the, the comics researcher, J. Grunstein, he talks a lot about how we can create meaning from having visual elements that rhymes with each other or that uh, braids, in the English translation is braiding, how they weave together meaning across the page. So say we have an element and then uh, many pages later you have the same element, then it creates a connection and it creates meaning in a different way than when we have uh, just verbal text. So we can be attentive to that. And I brought an example here from Persepolis, which is um, these two pages are not next to each other. There are two pages that there are several uh, uh, pages apart. Uh, Persepolis was published in French in four volumes and then put together in one volume. Um, in some instances in the Danish uh, version, it's two volumes. And book, in book one, it's about 
uh, Maji, the main characters, uh, growing up in Iran, and then how, because of the uh, regime change there, um, she has to uh, be sent away and she goes to Europe. And the second book is about her stay in Europe. She then comes back to Iran uh, later on in the story. But this first page on on the on the left side is from when Margie has to leave and she has to go to Europe, um, and she turns around and she sees that her mother has fainted in the arms of her father because she's so um, sad that she has to uh, uh, give up her daughter and send her away. So we have this image as a reader, and we can recognize it in the context of the story where we're reading it, and then many pages later. The grown Margie has come back to Iran and she started at the Art Academy and she is given the assignment that she has to draw the Iranian mother and uh, this is uh, at a point in time in history when uh, the Iran-Iraq war is at its highest in the 80s. So um, she makes a drawing of uh, an Iranian soldier that has passed away and his mother that is uh, sitting with him in, in her arms. And she says explicitly in the text, um, and I'm sorry, I could only find my Danish version, um, but uh, she says in the text here that she's making a visual, intertextual visual reference to um, Michel Angelos Pieta. Uh, but then as a reader, we can also notice that she's also visually referencing back into her own comic and this uh, theme of uh, parents uh, sacrificing themselves or uh, the soldier that sacrifices himself, uh, the the relationship between um, parents and children is linked. And there's a meaning that is created across the comic, which is not something that is written uh, in the text. It's not something that is in the context where the image is, but it's something that is created when the reader reads across the whole work. So that's one of the things that I uh, find interesting when we start comics is that looking at uh, the ways that the visual elements can create meaning across uh, space. But uh, I'll uh, move on because uh, when I'm talking about comics, uh, time always flies. Uh, I brought another example and that's an, an example of closure, uh, the way that we have to uh, add meaning. When we talk about uh, verbal uh, literature, we very often talk about reading between the lines or filling in the empty gaps. And uh, reading comics is a lot about uh, filling in the empty gaps. And I brought an example here from a Norwegian uh, cartoon artist, Jason. Wait, Hey Wait is a little uh, story about uh, two friends and they have this uh, a dare in the woods where you have to swing um, in a branch and then um, the story here is that he's he's saying that today he will do it and then his friend says hey wait we see him attempt the jump and then the next page is uh, six black squares so in the gap between we see him jumping and the black squares, we as readers have to decide, to decide what happened. And when the next page is made up of different types of elements, these are not narrative elements. It's not something that we can put together in a narrative. It's just fragments, like Scott McLeod was talking about. We have to put the fragments together to make sense of it. And then on the next page, uh, there's a heavy rain and we get different aspects of the city and the rain. And then um, the main character's father says, are you coming? And he's dressed in this attire that looks like funeral attire. So filling in the gaps and moving from one page to the other, we're trying to figure out what happened. And uh, uh, we as readers conclude that when he made the jump, he actually didn't survive it. But it's not something that is explicit. It's something that we have to uh, uh, figure out from looking at um, the different fragments. So a very a big part of analyzing comics, if you're looking at it formally, is looking at all these different uh, elements, the visual, the verbal, but also the composition and how they're put together. <laughs> 
Another thing, of course, that's important, I showed you examples now from black and white comics, uh, but I brought an example here from um, uh, David Matricelli's A Serious Polyp. That's not a youth comic. That's definitely one of the comics that is a graphic novel that has adult comic uh, content because it's um, it's about an uh, architect in midlife crisis. Um, I brought the example today to show you one of the ways it, because it's such an explicit example of how uh, line and color and style can add meaning to uh, our analysis of comics and when we look at how comics create meaning. Um, the story here is that uh, Asterius Polyp, in the, if we look at the middle here, is an architect and we can see he's drawn with a blue kind of uh, hard architect drawing like style um, and then he meets Hannah and she's drawn in a very different uh, more fussy pink um, style not so sharp edges and uh, no uh, uh, black uh, line out so we immediately get a sense of what are they like as uh, persons what a lot of uh, personal characteristics can be uh, deduced from looking at the way that they're drawn and when we see them speak together they uh, their styles merge so they get completely absorbed by each other at this party then on the right hand side uh, hannah in the end um, is uh, fed up with Asterius Polyp and his um, his uh, self absorbment and the way that he uh, lives his life, and she decides to leave him, and then their styles are separated, and we experience that uh, 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 break between them very clearly because their their styles are separated. So that's just to draw your attention to um, uh, the ways that color and line and style can can be be something that we should also pay attention to in comics. Um, uh, I brought an example, a Finnish example that I've studied a lot myself, which I think is a, a, can be an example of an, a, a comic that can be for young people. Um, this is my English version, Sing No Evil. Uh, it's called Perkeros in, in Finnish, and it's a story about uh, a young uh, man who uh, he wants to um, he wants to make a band, uh, an avant-garde heavy metal band, and then. Um, when that, uh, but then all these magic things happen, and maybe there's also something about uh, the occult, and it becomes a little bit of a fantastical. So it's a very genre mixing uh, comic. And um, I brought an example because I think it ties together some of the things I've been trying to say with formal analysis is that um, uh, here we can see line, color. Uh, the way that the composition of this uh, two-page spread uh, really uh, adds a lot of meaning and gives us an impression of how the music actually sounds. Because, of course, it's a silent comic, um, but um, but here we can get an impression uh, because there's a lot of meaning conveyed in, in the visual elements. And also just to highlight a, a, a Finnish a local uh, comic that is um, is also uh, this uh, building story that uh, is um, a great uh, read. Um, I actually I put a short movement break in my um, in my uh, slides here because I thought we needed a break to stand up and move around a little bit. But I can tell that I'm already uh, 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 I've used up too much time, and uh, it's soon it's going to be time for us to ask questions. So um, let's make it a, a a little bit of a mental short movement break, and I'll just uh, finish off by giving you a few points uh, about thematical analysis analysis and uh, comics and teaching before uh, I, uh, I end my talk and then we can have questions. So I brought a few slides just to show you this wide array of comics research that's being done. This, these are only titles about superheroes, but what it, um, it points to is that there is a lot of different ways of looking at superhero comics. There, there's this study of whiteness and American superheroes comics death, disability, and the superhero. Um, so just to say that if you are uh, studying literature and you have, like you have um, 
you're studying gender or you're studying um, post-colonial, uh, post-modernist, uh, you have an approach that uh, you want to analyze the comics uh, from, the, from that theoretical perspective, you can bring them into comics as well. A lot of people are doing that. So there's a lot of um, thematical analysis being done as well. And very often, of course, formal analysis and thematical analysis, they're not separate things. Very often we use the formal analysis to support some of our themes and to show how um, the ways that the, the, the comics are uh, put together are um, supporting the, the themes or the, the other approaches that we might have to looking at the comics. Um, but also just to say that with superheroes, superheroes are very back, big in America, not so much in Europe. Um, but there are, of course, a lot of different other types of comics. And I think a very important thing to think about when we look at young people and children's literature and comics is that there are so many different topics out there. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, we can, there's actually also a lot of research being done, so we can go to different types of uh, titles to get inspiration and um, find ways of looking at something like, I was saying a lot of autobiographical comics, but also um, comics, digital comics is also a big thing that people are studying. Um, so um, there are a lot of different approaches to comics. And then of course, children, youth and uh, comics, there's actually also uh, at least in English, uh, quite a few titles on that's looking specifically at children as readers, uh, children's comics, uh, historical, ch different types of historical children's comics, and also um, uh, uh, children in comics. So this field of children and uh, young people's comics is also one that is uh, growing rapidly when we look at, um, at research traditions. Um, one of the things I was saying is that there's a lot of different types of comics and that there's a lot of different genres when we look at children's uh, reading uh, habits and, and the things that are being published. I just brought uh, an example of um, Malin Fal Falk is a Norwegian artist, but she's been in the other Nordic countries as well, uh, the kind of fantasy Nordic, a little bit of Norse mythology, um, fantasy comic, but then of course also Catineri um, and uh, uh, different types of maybe the Gothic or uh, the the horror or um, uh, that as a kind of a genre and then humor is of course a very big thing with children and young people's comics um uh, it's a very popular genre someone like um uh dogman by dave pilkey is actually also um translated into finnish um so one of the exciting things about uh, children and uh, uh, or young people and comics is also this genre mix. And I just brought one example from uh, C.C. Bell's El Defo, where we can clearly see when um, the main character here uh, gets her hearing aid, she actually gets superpowers because now she can hear without what everybody's talking about across the hallway. And um, uh, she, become, she becomes the superhero and we can see that visually, but we can also see that uh, the tradition I was talking about with funny animals is also something that is very clear. The main characters is uh, depicted as a rabbit. So when we look at comics, we very often have to look at how they mix uh, different genres uh, um, uh, in in the in the youth comics. So, just a few final words about uh, teaching with comics or teaching comics because that's that's a big thing, of course, for teacher students. But also, if you work at a library or if you uh, are working with uh, young uh, adult literature and comics, uh, then. Uh, how to teach and how to work with comics and teaching is uh, something that's also, as you can see here, just a few titles on how you can teach with graphic novels or how you can teach in graphic narratives, comics. We get uh, the yellow kid again, makes a reappearance. Um, and um, I just want uh, a few points on uh, why uh, we should uh, use comics as material or think about it as children's literature that we teach on the same level as all the other uh, literary uh, materials that we bring into our teaching. Um, as I was saying, uh, 
this is child is coming for children, is it not? Uh, sometimes we come across uh, people that are skeptical or that might have ideas where we say, well, um, it's all good and well that they're reading comics when they're not, uh, when they haven't really learned how to read yet. It might help them with the images, but then they have to study real literature, meaning uh, literature that doesn't have pictures in it. And I, as I've been talking a lot about how comics is also something that's for grown-ups. So, um, it, in my opinion, everybody should have the reading experience of reading comics, regardless of their age. But one of the arguments is actually when we look at the studies that have been made from bringing com comics into the classroom is um, some students really respond well to reading comics and it heightens their motivation and the the desire for reading and they start reading a lot more and talking about manga is one of the things that um, uh, students uh, or in or young people like to read and they also something like one piece by now i think there's a hundred volumes and not that many are translated but still you get hooked on a series then there's a lot of reading being done reading manga or one of the other comic series multimodal literacy is a big thing in in the world that we live in today so of course that's an important part of it and the idea that some of the children that are not fond of reading or they have difficulty reading, uh, they might think that it's easier to read comics uh, so we can uh, lure them into reading comics. And then there's actually a lot of complicated things going on, as I was talking about with uh, visual uh, literacy and thinking about text and image. So there's a lot of um, uh, good reading going on when they read comics. And then it actually, I think comics is a great way for children to create things themselves, talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, participatory um, uh, communities and, and making comics about different topics. Um, a, a small point that I often talk about when I'm out uh, giving lectures is the way that the graphic novel is also something that has uh, really highlighted uh, comics as fiction. But there are a lot of comics that are non-fiction, and that's something that we can also consider taking into our teaching. Um, here is um, uh, an account. The, the personal narratives, of course, tell stories. This is a story from a refugee camp, and uh, uh, from the main character's perspective, there is a, a book about about the um, uh, civil rights movements in the US. There is a um, sexual education book, that's a Danish title that came out recently about, um, uh, uh, that is uh, sex education full of very uh, factual materials. And then uh, this uh, Finnish uh, comic about uh, uh, biodiversity and uh, the, the challenges of uh, climate change. So a lot of topic, topics, uh, topics can actually also be taught in the comic form. This is just an example I brought uh, from uh, an English example. Jay Hosler made an entire comic about the life cycle of bees. So that's a biology book, but in a comic format. Science comics is a whole series that, uh, at least in the English language, uh, has a focus on how to teach science topics in the comics form. Um, and the last thing I want to highlight, and then I'll stop and ask all the questions you want, is um, have the children make their own comics. Uh, they can make comics about topics that they've had in school. They can make uh, uh, comics where they remediate a text. So if you're reading other literary works, maybe you're reading a classic, maybe you're uh, reading something that is older literature that the students have to acquire knowledge of, a great way of having them really focus on the text and reading into the text is having them make it into a comic. They can draw themselves, they can make it in one of the digital programs, you can make collage comics. There are a lot of different ways of being productive uh, about comics. So that's just a, 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 an encouragement to have uh, children and young people make their own comics and engage with different topics uh, through the form of comics. And I brought an example um, that is um, very dear to my heart. Well Comics Finland is an organization that uh, goes to different places in the world and make comic uh, workshops with um, different local communities. So it's just another way of highlighting the way that comics can be a very personal um, form of expression and it can give voice to the 
to the uh, people that are making the comics. The simple thing is here, you have a big sheet of paper, you divide it into four squares, and then you have four panels and you can make a, copy, a comic about something that is very important to you. So one of the things that they do is that they they make these comics and then you can put them on the wall and the community can read um, what is the issues that are burning with you, what are the things that you're concerned about. So um, that was all that I had uh, for today. I It became a very quick one and I apologize for that, but I wanted to both give you the sense of what's the historical circumstances uh, that when we engage with young people and comics now uh, we're influenced by all this history uh, the deep dive with looking into how to analyze comics and then also encourage everyone to um, make comics and if you're hanging out with children or young people uh, make comics with them and have them make their own comics <laughs>